thanks a lot for coming along. Um, so this presentation is a summary of the work we've done on several orogenic gold deposits. And we try, what we were trying to do is understand the formation of very high grade mineralization and how uh, colloidal gold relates to how or associated with the formation of high grade mineralization. And when I'm talking about high grade mineralization, I'm talking about that type of sample. So all the yellow you see, it is gold. So it's uh, this type of ama amazing quartz veins that I'm going to talk about. And so yeah, the very important part, before I start, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Nico, Denis, Laure, uh, Steve, Sarah, and Alexandra, because uh, this was very much of a team effort. So I divided this presentation in four parts. First, I will... Sorry, Laura, can you speak, speak up? Uh, is it better now? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I divided in four parts. First, I will talk about the background of this study. Um, what do we know about high-grade mineralization and what we don't know? I'm going to describe our case study, uh, present our method and results, and how um, we interpret our results and how they relate to the formation of high-grade mineralization. Just very briefly, why we are doing this study, the economical context. So we think high-grade mineralization is very important, uh, especially in a context of um, increasing cost of gold discovery and a decreasing amount of uh, gold mine discovered. Uh, High-grade gold mineralization is obviously a very uh, valuable um, discovery for a mining company. But it is also a um, type of deposit that generates less waste um, when it's exploited and also associated with uh, less consumption of energy, etc. So it is also a more sustainable option for the future. So where do you find high granularization? You see on this diagram that shows tonnage versus grades that on average, orogenic gold deposits have the highest gold grades, um, followed by epithermal deposits. So what is an orogenic deposit? What uh, we're referring to when we talk about orogenic deposits, it's a gold-only uh, deposit. It is formed in a metamorphic belt, and it is um, structurally controlled, so associated with structural feature. It is emplaced at mid-crystal depths and formed at temperature that range between 250 and 450 degrees approximately, and formed at elevated pressure. The fluid that are responsible for this type of mineralization are generally low in salinity, uh, rich in CO2 and H2S, and have a near neutral pH. And uh, as I said, orogenic mineralization sometimes produce very high grade uh, mineralization. Um, and this high grade mineralization is expressed as a quartz vein that contains lots of uh, visible gold. The visible gold can be up to 20% or more of uh, the vein. So that brings me to our research objective. Um, so we want to understand high-grade mineralization better um, in order to explore more efficiently for this type of deposits. And we think that the key in understanding high-grade mineralization better is to understand how gold is transported in a hydrothermal fluid in the crust. But first, what do we know about gold transport? Um, so at a condition, fluid condition of the formation of orogenic deposits, a thermodynamic experiment tells us that gold is most stable when it's um, under the form of a hydrosulfide complex, so an, aqu an aqueous species dissolved um, in a fluid. And um, so, it is a molecule that can be represented um, like this, and that is how gold would be most stable in an aqueous fluid. To form a deposit, uh, you need to destabilize this molecule by changing the fluid condition. You can change the pH or the temperature, most often the pressure in orogenic deposit. So you destabilize this molecule and uh, you deposit gold and you form a gold mineralization. However, in some cases, um, the transport of gold under the form of a gold hydrosulfide uh, complex doesn't explain the formation of veins such as this one. You see here a vein, relatively narrow, that is very highly concentrated in gold. And the reason why it's difficult to explain the formation of this vein with gold transported under the form of hydrosulfide complex is because this 
um, molecules, solubility in a fluid is limited. The, the maximum concentration of this molecule in a fluid will uh, vary depending on the sulfur content of the fluid, but it will always remain in the PPB level. So if you have only few PPB of gold in solution, it's very difficult to explain the formation of this type of vein. Or you need a huge or humongous amount of fluid circulating through the vein. But in some deposits, we don't have evidence for a lot of fluid circulation in the vein. So that's why we were, people were thinking uh, about alternative transport mechanism for gold and propose that gold might be transported as a colloid. And this is not a new idea. Um, it was proposed 100 years ago to explain some very rich epithermal deposits in Nevada. In this type of deposit, you see um, veins of um, coliform opaline silica and uh, layers of electrum. And researchers proposed that these veins were formed from the deposition of colloidal silica and colloidal electron. Colloidal silica would deposit as a silica gel, which is an aggregation of colloidal silica and would form opaline silica. And the electron result from the deposition of colloidal electron. But what is a gold colloid? So a gold colloid is a particle that is entirely made of gold atoms, and this particle is of nanometric size. To be called a colloid, this nanoparticle must be in a stable suspension in a different medium. And in our case, the medium is a hydrothermal solution. And these colloids, uh, they have specific properties. They are negatively charged, and they have a large surface area compared to their volume, which gives them unique properties. And they also form, or we say they nucleate, from a solution that is supersaturated in gold. And most importantly, why we are very interested in gold colloids is having gold colloids in your solution can in increase the concentration of gold by 5,000 times compared to gold transported as a hydrosulfide complex. That is why gold colloids are very relevant uh, to us when we are trying to understand high-grade gold mineralization. And so I said that gold colloids are negatively charged. That means that they mutually repulse each other. However, the repulsive forces between the colloid is easily overcome. If uh, the nanoparticle or the colloid collides, they will aggregate. And this is especially true at higher temperature. The cold colloid will uh, coagulate spontaneously. And this is not very good for transport because if the colloid coagulates spontaneously, they will drop out of solution and be deposited. But there is um, two uh, experimental uh, research that were um, one, uh, a very old one and a very recent one that shows that uh, gold colloids can be stable in a solution if they are associated to colloidal silica. Colloidal silica will increase the repulsive forces between the gold colloids, and it will also act as a barrier um, protecting or um, from aggregation. But do uh, they exist uh, in natural system? Can we find gold colloids? Uh, recently, uh, we have we've seen some evidence. Uh, this is an example from an epithermal deposit. Uh, where they've see, they, that was published last month, I think, they've seen electron nanoparticle um, uh, in a calcite, I think, yeah, calcite. And we also find gold uh, nanoparticle in, in uh, some black smokers. Um, in, in organic system, um, the contribution of Gold and silica colloids was um, proposed a while ago in 1993 to explain the formation of uh, gold and quartz veins. But at the time, they couldn't image um, the uh, gold nanoparticle in, uh, in their samples. However, recently, two studies, uh, one from Chris Voisy at Monash and uh, one from us, uh, demonstrated that gold colloids do occur in uh, organic deposits. And that brings me to the aim of the study. 
So um, we want uh, to understand, we think high-grade mineralization is related somehow to colloidal gold. So we want to understand uh, what role uh, colloidal uh, plays and how they are transported to form high-grade mineralization. And in order to do this, we uh, studied samples from five different orogenic gold deposits that were formed at different ages, from the Archean to the Cretaceous, formed at different depths. Um, we have quite a range of depth from 6 to 1.5 kilometers, and they also formed in different host rocks. This is a map that shows you the location of our samples, and this is the samples that we studied. They are all quartz veins with visible gold. This sample is uh, from Archean mineralization from the Discovery Mine. This is our most recent sample from a Cretaceous deposit in the US. This is our, most, the, our oldest sample, um, which is from uh, Archean mineralization at the Red Lake Mine in Canada. This is a sample from the Beta Hunt Mine in Cambalda, uh, which is also Archean mineralization. And this is a sample from the Cali deposit, which is Proleozoic, and um, in the Northern Territory in Australia. This section here shows you where these different mineralization formed uh, in the crust. And we know this from three inclusion studies that were done on these deposits um, in the past. And uh, over all of these deposits, the one we know the best is Cali, uh, because I did my PhD on this deposit and I try to understand the control on high-grade mineralization. So to do this, um, we looked at the controls at different scale. We started at um, the large scale, uh, all the way to the nano scale. And um, just to give you a bit of background on what we've done, I'm gonna briefly go through um, the geological background of uh, the Cali deposits. So Cali is in the granite Tanami origin. It is, uh, part of the Dead Bullock Soak Mining Lease, uh, which is held by Newmont. The deposit is on an anticline of folded metasedimentary rocks. The first uh, control that we see on mineralization is a structural control. So mineralization is associated with um, structural pathways or corridors that are north, east, south, west trending that we identified as the, as the second deformation event um, at Cali. And these structural pathways are characterized by a very high vein density. The veins are parallel to the structural pathways and they are associated to the mineralization. Actually, there is two types of mineralization that you can find at Cali. There's one that is lower grade, uh, which looks like this. Uh, it consists of gold associated to sulfide and you find it when the structural uh, pathways are intersecting uh, sedimentary rocks that are rich in iron. The mineralization type that we are interested in is this one. It consists of quartz vein uh, with visible gold, and you find it when the veins are intersecting um, metasedimentary rocks that are rich in uh, carbonaceous material. And just as a summary, this is a diagram of the Cali system with the folded uh, metasedimentary rocks. So you have different types of metasedimentary rocks. Some are rich in iron, some are rich in carbonaceous material. And in red, the structural pathway with all the veins that providing a conduit for the mineralizing fluid. When this fluid is interacting with the iron-rich host rock, we um, get this lower grade type of mineralization. And when the fluid is interacting with carbonaceous host rock, we find this type of um, vein hosted mineralization. And in some cases, like this one, it's really amazing. We have small veins, this one is one centimeter uh, in width, and it is highly concentrated in gold. In this type of uh, vein, we don't have evidence for lots of fluid circulation. The alteration around the vein is barely visible. So this is for this type of sample that we decided, oh, we need to find an explanation for this. And that's where we started to look for colloids. And we uh, actually selected this particular sample to conduct this study. 
So that is the method that we applied. So we selected a high grade uh, sample. We made a thin section or mount out of it. We looked at it under the um, scanning electron microscope. And uh, we focused specifically on gold. We noticed that the gold grain contained inclusion, very small inclusions, uh, filled with silica or carbon. As an example here, we see this backscatter image um, of a gold grain here with a bit of quartz. And some of these black dots are inclusions. So when I say small inclusion, I'm talking one to two micrometer in diameter. And we thought that these inclusions were a good place to look for colloids. Um, so in order to look for colloids, we needed to use another um, instrument uh, that allows you to look for nanoscale objects. And the process was not uh, trivial. We need to extract the area of interest from the thin section using a focused iron beam um, electron microscope. And we do, we extract this um, area of interest by digging trench around it, extracting the sample, mounting it on a small grid to obtain what we call a foil. And this foil is only 10 micrometer in length and only less than 100 nanometer in thickness, I think. And this is what um, we used. So once uh, we, um, pre we have finished preparing this foil, we can look at it with transmission electron microscopy. That allows us to see nanoscale objects, but that also allows us to see the um, crystalline structure of um, the objects we're looking at. So back to Kali. Um, so this is the foil that we extracted from this sample. You see here a gold grain. This is a quartz grain, and this is the inclusion we were interested in. That was at the surface of um, the thin section, but now we look at, we're looking at it, um, a section of it. This is TEM images of this inclusion. What you see in white here uh, is gold. The dark um, material is amorphous material. Part of it is made of carbon in green. Part of it is made of silica. And the white blobs that you see there, with an unlearned image here, are gold nanoparticles. Some are isolated in the amorphous silica. Some are clustered at the contact between the gold and uh, the inclusion. So here was our evidence. We do have evidence of colloidal gold associated with high grain mineralization. And we also have amorphous silica, which is an evidence for the contribution of colloidal silica. Amorphous silica is um, made from a silica gel. A silica gel is an aggregation of colloidal silica. Um, so we were quite happy with this. And we, used, we applied the same method to all our samples. This is very briefly an example from the Red Lake deposit. So we also uh, extracted a foil with an inclusion. The inclusion is filled with amorphous carbon. And inside the amorphous carbon, we found lots of nanoparticles of electron in this case. I'm not going to show you all the samples because it's a bit repetitive. So you're going to have to trust my um, summary table. So in the end, we found electron nanoparticle in uh, the Red Lake deposit sample. We found gold uh, nanoparticle in the beta hand sample gold and silver oxide in the discovery sample, gold at Cali, and copper nanoparticle in the 16 to 1 sample. And all of these nanoparticles are associated with carbon, most of the time amorphous carbon, in one case microcrystalline carbon, and most of the time they also are associated with amorphous silica. The, the observation of amorphous carbon inclusion in gold was very intriguing. That was never reported before, and that was not very expected to find amorphous carbon in inclusion in gold. Um, so we looked at the composition of this amorphous phase, and it's actually not only composed of carbon, it contains also a significant amount of oxygen and uh, nitrogen. And then finally, the last part, I will uh, talk about the implication of our results. 
So with this study, first we did show that gold nanoparticle is not something that is rare. We found them everywhere when we look at when we look um, nanoscale, for nanoscale objects. But we not only found gold nanoparticle, we found silver oxide, electron, and copper, which means that gold is maybe not the only metal that can be transported as a colloid in a hydrothermal solution. Potentially, other metals such as copper and silver also can be present in a hydrothermal fluid under the form of colloid. So that was a very important observation. And that also brings, um, make us asking this question, where did this nanoparticle form? Where did they nucleate? Unfortunately, we're not too sure. Um, but this study from MacLeish et al. published last month, um, so that was a study on an epithermal deposit, and they propose that in their case they formed electron nanoparticle. And uh, they proposed that the nanoparticle was formed in the upper part of a porphyry system, and they were formed because of boiling. So to form nanoparticle, you need to supersaturate your fluid in this element, and boiling would do this. So we could potentially imagine that we have such system below our orig orogenic deposit that is the source for the nanoparticle. But then how these nanoparticles are transported from this source to the deposit? Because we know that gold colloids tend to coagulate spontaneously at high temperature. So how, how transport is possible? We've seen that we have quite a range of uh, deposit depth, so it means that Potentially, these colloids are transported over several kilometers. And also, we need to take into consideration the fact that we found this amorphous carbon with the nanoparticle. And I want to go back to this composition of the amorphous phase. That we, so here is the composition of the different samples of the amorphous phase. And uh, I want to say that this, uh, the elements that we found are the same elements that we will find, find in fluid inclusion in orogenic system. So when we uh, look at fluid inclusion, in order to understand a bit better the mineralizing fluid of orogenic system, we will look for fluid inclusion in coarse grain associated to gold. And in orogenic system, these fluid inclusion are often composed of CO2, CH4, and N2. And I've put here the relative proportion of these different species in fluid inclusion from the Red Lake deposit. And we see that the relative proportion of these elements in the fluid inclusion of the Red Lake deposit are comparable to the proportion that we see in our amorphous carbon phase. So that led us to um, think that the amorphous carbon phase was actually um, coming from the precipitation of these different species, CO2, CH4, N2, that were originally present in the fluid and that were precipitated under the form of amorphous uh, carbon. Um, and this is also further supported by the fact that the deposits that we studied are not uh, hosted in the same host structure. Some of the host structures to this deposit don't have much carbon. So it is unlikely that the carbon is provided by the host truck. It is more likely in this case that the carbon is originating from the fluid. And that all these uh, elements led us to propose this model of nanoparticle emulsion. So we propose that transport of colloidal metal was made possible under the form of a colloidal emulsion. So this emulsion is composed of colloidal metal, colloidal silica, and gases of supercritical um, species that would be CO2, CH4, and N2. The colloidal silica would uh, prevent the aggregation of the colloidal metal, and the gases uh, CO2, CH4 would decrease the density of the emulsion and reduce its, viscos its viscosity that would allow the transport and the ascent from the source to the deposit. We think that changing fluid condition at the site of mineralization, such as change in pressure or specific fluid rock interaction process might have destabilized 
it is colloidal emulsion. And that the carbon species in the emulsion would have precipitated under the form of amorphous carbon, and the colloidal silica would have precipitated under the form of amorphous silica inside veins. When amorphous silica, for example, crystallized into quartz, all the colloidal metal associated to them were pushed out to the grain boundary and formed coarse gold grain. When the gold crystallized, we think some of this amorphous material was trapped as inclusions, and that is what we found in our samples. So finally, to conclude, uh, this study has shown that colloidal metal exists. They are not rare, and they definitely are part of the process, the mineralization process. We have also seen that they are systematically associated with amorphous carbon and silica, which means that they play a role uh, in the transport or deposition of the colloidal metal. And we think this role is by uh, allowing the transport under the form of um, nanoparticle emulsion. So we think that this data set is changing the way we think about hydrothermal fluid. Maybe metals are not all or always transported as a molecule, an aqueous complex. Maybe part of these metals are transported under the form of colloids. And finally, a very important point is that we still have very little experimental data on a nanoparticle of gold and even less of the metal uh, in a hydrothermal fluid. So it is still very difficult to uh, um, understand how these particles would behave in a natural system. And in relation to this, I'm very excited to say that we'll start a new research project, hopefully next month, uh, which will be um, fully dedicated to understand better this high grade mineralization and colloidal metal. Uh, this project is supported by uh, industry partners and the ARC. Um, it is a collaboration project between UWA, Curtin, uh, Monash, and CSIRO, and hopefully will help us to understand better uh, this um, different transport mechanism for gold. And I thank you very much for your attention.